point being that we could not CRA, 10 million people gained houses based on we played a role, many community organizations came together to play a role. That income transfer was worth billions and billions of dollars. The, the work I did on citizen wealth, I think the agreements we signed were probably uh, critical in getting five to seven million of those houses. Um, it changed, it moved the needle in a mass terms for African American and Latino home ownership, which created real assets that no longer exist. Now in the Great Recession, that needle has gone back 25 or 30 years that we accomplished through CRA. But in, in the state question that I, I chose to try to respond to, when the Clinton administration refused, as the first Democratic administration, to actually deal with the federal minimum wage, that old thinking about how power worked and, and public impact and, and government, you, didn't, you couldn't count on a, raise in minimum, a rise in minimum wage. So that forced us to embrace living wage movements. If you look solely at the statewide initiatives we did to raise the minimum wage, which meant huge political uh, engineering to get them on the ballots, I mean, it took more than a million signatures to get on the ballot in 2004 in Florida. It took several million that you had to move in terms of votes there. If you just looked at 2004, the transfer to 300,000 workers of two and a half billion dollars, and if you saw the New York Times chart recently on which states pay more than the prevailing minimum wage federally now, those states in that chart are states inordinately that we won and won an index on, so that that's a gift that keeps giving. Acorn may be dead, but there's still lower income working families that are receiving the benefits of, of those victories. In 2006, it was even more dramatic, because Ohio was on the ballot then, Arizona, et cetera. Um, if you looked over, and there's a chart in Citizen Wealth that goes through this, the millions of workers that got direct income benefits because we were able to put together the, the statewide kinds of organizational resources and capacity to put those on the ballot and then emerge victorious, does make a difference. One of the things that was amazing to me in listening to the liberal critique of ACORN in the 2008 election and then in uh, 2009 was this whole notion that maybe ACORN was too big. You know, maybe it wasn't too big to fail, obviously, um, <laughs> as it turns out. That, that now is factual. But that somehow it, it was too big. And that sort of notion that community organizations are these small, precious things is, is, has to be something that is so contrary to any historical record that ends up being produced. We have to resist that. The real truth, and this is what I used to argue time and time, poor Fred has heard this when he was in, you couldn't get the big head. At the point I left, we were on a, on, in the process of a whole family of organizations, we might have spent that year $100 million. But that's really only the size of two or three large super centers in Walmart. Um, you know, this is, it seems like a lot of money in scale if you look at small civic associations that are dealing with planning a local park or whether or not the garbage truck kicked over a can. This is not what ACORN was. It was about moving people that needed a voice, who demanded a, a way to participate in change and make that change. And we were too small. Um, I thought when I left that for whatever reasons we'd gotten it somewhat right and that they, we would be able to protect the institution. And that turned out not to be the case for whatever reason. And, There'll probably be many books, I don't know that I'm going to write one, but uh, there'll probably be many books on how that, that happened. Um, and there's no question on the answer to this question. I remember when we first started negotiating with H&R Block, they said, to start to negotiate, uh, they said, well, are you meeting with us because we're the worst or because we're the biggest? No, I, I quickly said, it has nothing to do with worst, you're the biggest. We beat you, everybody else falls in line. And I think that was what the right understood and going after ACORN so aggressively, and what ACORN clearly somehow became unmoored to is the fact that it had no base of support outside of its, its own membership. And if you look at the difference in Planned Parenthood's response to the similar attack now, where Cecile Richards brilliantly went, waited, set it up, dressed it, and went after Susan B. Komen Foundation solely because she needed to have a way to go to her base and let the base either respond that they were going to rise up and protect Planned Parenthood or let, let it move the other way. And that's the one thing that ACORN, for whatever reason, 
miscalculated the end is it didn't go to its base, and its base is where its, its strength was, and that's not in any community, that's in little modern income families. Thank you. Thank you.